You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have a great guest today, Margaret McFall Knight. Uh, she's a director of the Pacific Biosciences Research Center, a professor. Uh, she's in the Kualo Marine Laboratory at the uh, University of Hawaii, and she's studying animal and bacterial symbioses. So, uh, Margaret, thanks for coming. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Yeah. So what in particular, what kind of uh, symbiosis are you studying and what creature and, you know, what's the, the function where there's a symbiosis going on? So uh, my lab studies the Hawaiian bobtail squid, and it is a native Hawaiian animal, and it has associated with it a luminous bacterium. And this bacterium makes light that the animal uses in its behavior. So this particular animal uh, comes out at night uh, to eat. Uh, it's a night active predator. And uh, during the day, it buries in the sand. Uh, at night, it, the way it forages is it hangs in the water column and just waits for something to go by and then it goes after it. So it's in a three-dimensional homogeneous environment and uh, with nowhere to hide immediately. And so what it does is it camouflages using the bacterially produced light. So it uses its symbiont light, symbiont light, to match downwelling moonlight and starlight so it doesn't cast a shadow against the visual field of a predator looking up from below. So there are various fishes and monk seals and so on and so forth that um, are known to prey on this little squid. This uh, squid is only uh, a couple centimeters or so long, about an inch long. And um, as most calamari, they're pretty yummy. <laughs> and so uh, there is a variety of predators that will prey on them. And so they do their very best to camouflage using the light produced by their symbiote. How did you uh, first encounter these squid and how do you study them? You have them in a tank in the in the office, or are you somehow able to tag them and study them uh, in the ocean? Yeah, so so um, I was doing a dissertation at University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, and my study site was the Central Philippines, and I was working on fishes that do this behavior. In other words, count what they call counter-illumination, emitting light out of your bottom surface to match downwelling moonlight and starlight. And uh, the problem is fish are very difficult to raise in the laboratory. So I happened to be at a meeting and uh, a scientist at the University of Hawaii, you know, at this time, of course, I was at UCLA, but there was a scientist at this meeting uh, from University of Hawaii. And he came up to me and he said, you know, there's this squid in Hawaii that you can raise through its life cycle in the laboratory. And uh, it lays eggs in the lab and, you know, you can do all of those sorts of things. And the other thing that was important was it had recently been reported that its uh, luminous bacterial symbiote was an organism named Vibrio fisheri. And Vibrio fisheri, this particular bacterial species, um, at that point was a very well-known bacterium because it, its light production was used as a genetic tool 
to transfer into other animals to make aspects of their biology also luminous. And so uh, it was a very well understood microbe. So all the stars were aligned. There was a squid that you could raise, there was an animal you could raise in the laboratory, and there was a bacterium that a lot of people had worked on. And so um, one of those persons was a guy named Ned Ruby, who, while at Scripps Oceanography, uh, had done his dissertation on Vibrio Fisheri ecology. And so uh, I asked him whether or not he would be interested in collaborating with me because I'm an animal physiologist biochemist and not a microbiologist and knew that it was important to get a very, very good microbiologist studying the microbe side and so that my lab could study the, the animal side. So he said that he would do it. And so we, we came to Hawaii and we collected our first squid. And at that point, both of us were at the University of Southern California. And we began to study this animal by, we brought them to the University of Southern California. And just like everybody said, they laid eggs in the lab. And so we basically go out into the field uh, on, you know, sort of every few months. And we collect only, you only need eight to 10 females and six to eight males. And that will keep you in about 50 to 100,000 juveniles a year. So these guys hatch from, you know, they mate and lay eggs in the lab and they hatch from the eggs after about 20 days of being an embryo. And they hatch without their symbiote, um, just like humans are born without their microbes in their gut. And so what so we do is that, when, when is the uh, bacteria? That's what I was going to ask you is, is uh, when does the bacteria interact with the squid? When does it not? So go ahead, please. Ah, yeah. So, you know, just immediately upon hatching, immediately upon hatching, they uh, they begin their, the, so in during embryogenesis, the juvenile, the, the embryonic squid develops a series of ciliated surfaces on the lateral side of the nascent light organ. And what happens is when they hatch, they, the cilia on the sides of that of the organ start to beat uh, like crazy, bringing water that has Vibrio fisheri in it um, over the, the, the light organ, the would-be light organ. At the base of these ciliated structures, on each side are three pores, and the bacteria go into those pores. And they go into those pores, they go up ducts, they go in into uh, what we call an antechamber, then they, a single one or sometimes two will squeeze through sort of a long bottleneck and then get into a crypt space and grow out and completely fill these crypt spaces. So there are six independent crypts on, um, in the animal. And this all happens, uh, the, what they do is they first gather the symbiont and they have to gather the right one which is only, so there are about a million cells per square centimeter or per mil of water in the ocean. And uh, Vibrio fisheri is only about 0.1% of those. So there are a thousand on average, probably about a thousand cells per mil. And so the animal has to, has to sieve out its, its partner. And it does that within two to three hours. And, it, and this happens all on the surface that it, it actually Get, gathers them on the surface. And then after they've gathered, they move into the tissue. And one of the things that, that's really interesting is, you know, how, how do they become very specific outside there? And in the absence of Vibrio fisheri, nothing else colonizes. So it's very specific. How do you, uh, how do you think the squid know to even look for the Vibrio fisheri? And how do they know how to filter for them. I mean, where is uh, that plan in their cells, do you think? Like, where it is weird. How would yeah. a creature know to, <laughs> I don't know, to find another creature that's not part of its uh, its genes, part of, I mean, it's not even yeah. its phenotype, it's, it's another step removed. Well, yeah, sure. Well, so during embryogenesis, the animal um, lays down a set, a chemistry and a landscape that has been co-evolved with Vibrio fisheri. So that they they have a secret language. So the way this what we know about how this works is that um, those ciliated fields I told you about they actually form a little ring um, just above these pores where Vibrio fisheri enters. 
And what they can do is they can, the first biomechanical step is to reject every particle that's over about two microns. And the bacteria are two microns. And so as the cilia are beating, anything that's over the size of the bacteria is rejected. Now, I just told you a few minutes ago that 10, there are a million bacteria per mil. Well, it turns out that most bacteria are about two microns. So it helps get rid of bigger organisms um, like plankton and stuff like that, but it doesn't help get the number of bacteria down. How that works is that's a chemical thing. And so what happens is Vibrio fisheri comes in and it has the ability to attach. And when it attaches to the surface of this ciliated field, it talks to the animal. It, it delivers something that causes the animal to change its gene expression and the production of various things, some of which are antimicrobial. And so what it does, is that the bacteria attach, change the host, the animal's gene expression, the animal pours out into that environment a bunch of antimicrobials, that it appears that Vibrio fisheri is uniquely capable of resisting. So what happens also is Vibrio fisheri sits out there for a while, and we know that while they're sitting out there, they have to turn on particular genes to be able to resist the journey that it goes through in-host tissue to get to eventually to the crypt spaces. And that is all antimicrobial. So what happens outside is that the animal exposes them to low levels of the very harsh chemicals, very harsh antimicrobials. The bacteria say, oh my gosh, I better get ready. And it turns on genes that, uh, the bacteria turn on genes that make it resistant because that, that migration pathway has those antimicrobials in much higher concentration. So the bacteria ready themselves. The other thing that's very cool is that the bacteria, when they attach, they, in, well, they cause the production of an enzyme called chitinase. Now chitin is a polymer, polymeric sugar. It's very abundant in the ocean. And it turns out that it's in the surface mucus where the bacteria are aggregated. And, but it's there as polymeric chitin. And it turns out that these bacteria are attracted to, to products of that polymeric chitin that are produced by the activity of the host chitinase. So what happens is that there are two things that are happening. One is the bacteria is sitting out there getting ready. And the other thing is that they're turning on genes that allow it to move toward a breakdown product of the chitin which is being poured out of the pore. And so they're attracted, what they call chemo, they, they're chemo attracted to this, this thing. Now that particular molecule wouldn't be made if the bacteria didn't attach and tell the animal to make that in high concentration and pour it out into the mucus and break down the, the polymeric chitin in the mucus so that um, the bacteria know where to go. Is that All right, question here. How, how, um... How fast does a change in gene expression occur, both in the Vibrio well, fisheri and in the host? Once you know, have you able to observe before and after and during, or no? Yeah, we are. So it happens uh, by three hours. So um, I had a wonderful graduate student, Natasha Kramer, who who is now a CNRS in France, and she uh, studied uh, the gene expression of the host in a symbiotic and a non-symbiotic animal. And so what she was doing was she was exposing the non-symbiotic animals to all the other bacteria in the seawater, but Vibrio fisheri was absent. And then uh, then the, those that were exposed to Vibrio fisheri was all the other bacteria in the surrounding seawater, and the water was spiked with, uh, with Vibrio fisheri. And so after three hours, what she did was she took the light organ out of those, you know, light organs out of those babies, and put those light organs in a chemical that freezes the, the RNA. Uh, it's called RNA later, and it just stops all transcription. And then she extracted the RNA and analyzed it, and she could see those big changes I'm talking about, you know, this change in antimicrobial and that change in that tightening. Now, the bacteria 
so few bacteria aggregate on the surface, usually on average it's five to 10, if you give the animal more of the fisheri, a greater proportion of the fisheri, they'll make a larger aggregate. But there's still too few cells to do a total transcriptome on the bacteria. What the bacteriologists have done at this point is rely on what the host is telling them is likely to be affecting the bacteria. So we told them that nitric oxide and antimicrobials, and another thing is that it's a low pH environment and in that area just above the pores. And so these various conditions, the, the uh, bacteriologist said, well, let's look at the genome of the bacterium and see what it does in response, see if there are genes that are known to be elements that are responses to these, uh, these things that the host uh, is doing, they are doing. So, so what the bacteriologists have is that they have genetics in the bacteria. So what they were able to do is genetically modify the bacteria so that they couldn't respond to chitin breakdown products so that they couldn't find where to go, <laughs> they couldn't find their way, or they, uh, there are genes that make them resistant to low pH and antimicrobials. And if they were mutated in those genes, they also could not find their way. So they were also not able to colonize. So how sophisticated is the communication between host and the Vibrio fisheri? Can you characterize it? Well, you can imagine Every gener we have never in the field ever found an animal working on this animal for 30 years. We've never found an animal that doesn't have a symbiont. And uh, you can imagine that making sure that you recruit and maintain that organism in stable association over the year-long lifetime of the animal has to require or would have to uh, require quite a bit of coevolution between the host and the symbiont. And so um, the language is quite sophisticated in the sense that at each stage of that colonization process I told you about, there are different genes that are upregulated and deployed. So there are genes associated with re that, that initial recruitment, and then there are genes associated with um, initial you know, development, um, inducing the development of the host. So interacting with with the um, host tissues, once the bacteria get colonized into the host tissues, they um, produce an irreversible signal for morphogenesis that results in the loss of those ciliated fields that are associated with recruitment. So it's almost like they go in and say, okay, I've got my symbiont, I don't need those really energy requiring structures on the surface, I'm just going to get rid of those. So the bacteria induce that, and that's associated with very dramatic changes in gene expression. And then, of course, as time goes by, there's also a maturation that happens uh, at about three weeks. And at that time point, there are different changes in gene expression. And then as you go on uh, later in life, there are still some others. They become, um, after about three weeks, they become highly rhythmic in their behavior, their, the, the host behavior, they begin to vary in the sand before about three weeks. They're kind of all over the place. And sometimes they're in the sand, sometimes they're out. But at about three weeks, they get serious about having a very, very profound rhythm. They vary in the sand during the day and come out at night. That is reflected in a tremendous change in gene, gene expression on a day-night cycle. So it's very deep. The, the, the association and the and the, the, um, the changes in gene expression and the responses and the com communication is constant between the host and the symbiont. And they, um, that allows them to maintain um, their symbiont throughout their life. Uh, part of that rhythm, it's very interesting, but part of that rhythm, uh, when the animal buries in the sand in the morning, it's less loose, it gets rid of about 90% of their symbiont. Um, into the surrounding seawater. It's a very interesting behavior. Um, of course, it, there's some control of symbiont number there. That is to say, you know, the bacteria grow very slowly inside of there. 
And so on a daily rhythm, they get rid of a certain proportion of them. Um, and then also um, uh, on this daily rhythm, they, um, they feed the water for the juvenile. So if you go to, in Hawaii, if you go to a beach and you collect a sample of water and you bring it into the lab and you put a baby squid in it, if the baby squid doesn't get colonized, that generally means that there are no adults in that water, in that area, on that particular beach, because the, 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 the adults are responsible for making uh, a microbial environment that will, will uh, promote colonization of the juvenile. Have you tried to raise any of the squid without any of the vibrio fissurae and see if they develop normally and behave normally? Yeah. So I had a really talented student in the lab. Um, uh, his name was Eric Hoke, and, and actually he just defended. And he, uh, Eric was able to raise the squid. Actually, it's not that difficult. It's just a little labor intense. Um, but he was able to raise the squid uh, through their life cycle. And um, he was able to, so one of the things that's cool about this symbiosis is that um, the currency of the symbiosis or the commodity that, that the animal gets uh, is light production and not a nutrient. So in most symbiotic associations or, you know, like in humans and in insects and so on and so forth, if they, the bacteria provide a vitamin or an amino acid or a nutrient of some sort um, that, and so that without their symbiont, they can be physiologically compromised and you have to supplement um, whatever the bacteria is giving if you can figure that out. In this case, the bacteria are giving the animal light that it uses in anti-predation. So in the lab, in the absence of the symbiont, there doesn't seem to be any difference that we can see between the symbiotic and the non-symbiotic animal. And that's, you know, they just, it's light production. And in the field, they would be picked off by a predator probably. <laughs> but in the lab, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to affect them to be non-symbiotic, which has been really great because we've been able to study the influence of the carriage of a symbiont on, on gene expression, not only in the light organ, but also in how the carriage of a symbiont influences the gene expression of remote tissues. And so recently, I had a student, Sylvia Moriano Gutierrez, who studied um, how colonization of the light organ affects remote tissues. And she focused on two. She focused on the eye, for one thing, because eyes are light receiving. Uh, they also modulate light, like the light organ, except they're photoreceptors instead of photogenerators. But the eye has lenses and iris analog, it has an iris and a, you know, a cord analog and all the things, you know, the components of an eye as does the light organ. So that was a cool one to look at. And then the other thing she looked at was the gills. And the gills um, are an immune organ in, in cephalopods and squids. And so what she did was she uh, figured that an immune organ might respond um, to the colonization of a bacteria somewhere else. Uh, in the animal. So what she found was fascinating, and that was that when she looked at the light organ transcriptome in the symbiotic and non-symbiotic animals, what she was looking at was 24 hours after the baby had been colonized or not. And at that time point, she could show that the principal change in gene expression was due to um, the, the production of light by the symbiote. And not not the production or not the presence of the bacteria. So that is to say that there was like you know a few thousand genes uh, uh, expressed. There were a few thousand genes expressed, and the greatest proportion of that change was because the bacteria were making light, and not because they were just they were a bacterial partner in them. And the way she was able to do that was to use a delta lux mutant. To colonize. And so a delta lux mutant is one that doesn't make life, that's been genetically modified not to make life. So that was cool. So then she looked at um, these remote tissues, and indeed, with the colonization of, uh, of the symbiont, 
she found that both the eye and the gill changed their gene expression. And what was interesting was they had their own signature. So it wasn't that they changed the expression of the same genes that the light organ did, but instead the eye had changes in its, in its own special way and the gill change in their own special way. But the really cool thing was that when she looked at the eye and the gill with the delta lux um, symbiont, in other words, the one that can't make light, the gills didn't change gene expression at all. In other words, they changed gene expression with the wild type and the delta lux, the same genes were regulated. And that was to say that was to say that the gills respond specifically to the presence of the bacterium and not if they're, if they don't care about the light production. In contrast, the eye, when you put a wild type and a delta lux in the light organ, the eye expressed a certain number of genes with the wild type, and none of those genes were regulated by the delta lux. So the eye is responding exclusively to the light produced by the bacteria. And this was interesting because the animal counter-illuminates, and the way they, in, at night, you know, like I was saying, it makes this light out of the central surface to match downwelling moon, moonlight and starlight, and it does that by receiving downwelling light through the eye, and then it coordinates with the light organ and tells the light organ how much light to put out. And so by colonizing the animal with a delta lux, you've disrupted some sort of communication likely that is associated with this coordination between the eye that results in proper counter-illumination. Okay, so the, the eyes of the squid are sensing the light and relaying that information through its cells to the vibrio fissurae, which then produce the appropriate you know, types of, of light to hide the creature, right? Well, I think actually what I think is happening in, rather is that the presence of light producing bacteria, they, they sort, of, sort of make the light constantly and the animal controls it. And so I think what's happening is that the animal, that, that when the bacteria are making light, they're talking to the animal tissue of the light organ and that animal tissue talks to the eye. And then, and then when the eye gets the message, um, it coordinates uh, with the tissues of the light organ and tells the tissues of the light organ to either produce or to either control the bacteria to make more or less light. Well, that's pretty amazing because that's like the squid taking on an extra sense. It's like oh, yeah. it's like me co-opting an eye, a special eye from another creature, and being able, my brain is able to use that eye in the same way that my brain uses my eyes to process sensory information. Right. Right. Yeah. It's like an inner eye. And what's more is that the squid genome has been recently sequenced. And when you look at the, the squid genome, and then you ask out of that genome, what transcripts are regulated in the eye? What, excuse me, what transcripts are regulated in the light organ? And many, many, many of them are transcripts that are regulated in the eye. And so it's like what is called evolutionary tinkering in other words, there are lots of things um, that sort of borrow from other parts of the body when they're making something new. And so sometimes that happens. So the light organ is like an inner eye. And I have to say that this, this convergence with the eye goes all the way from its morphology. In other words, the light organ has a lens and it has um, an iris analog to control the amount of light going out. Um, it has um, uh, a reflector behind it, which is like the tapetum in a cat's eye, you know, that reflector. It has a reflector to make sure that the light is um, going down um, instead of back out the, 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 the back end of the eye. It's going toward the bottom. Um, and it's got uh, a choroid analog, and that is the in our eye, we have a, a choroid, which is a, a pigmented tissue at the back of the eye that keeps stray light from going up to the back of the eye. So they have all those elements. The light organ has all those elements in the eye. And it's just an amazing thing. It's so reflected, the, the transcriptome is reflected in that sort of convergent evolutionary tinkering. 
The interesting thing is that females of Euprimna have another symbiotic organ, and that is something called the accessory nidamental gland. And that accessory nidamental gland, um, what the animal does, the female animal does, is when she lays eggs, she puts a, set, a patina of bacteria in the egg capsule. And that patina of bacteria, uh, and they're not really a fissuri, they're a consortium of other bacteria, puts a, this patina of bacteria around in the egg capsule, and that protects the eggs from fungal um, fungi uh, settling and growing on them. And the, the, it's called the accessory nidamental gland. And one of my former graduate students, who's now a professor at the University of Connecticut, studies the AMG, the accessory nidamental gland. And uh, what was interesting when the genome came out was when you look at the transcripts that are, of you know what they use in of the genome in the gene expression of the accessory nidamental gland, they use a huge number of genes for which there's no there's no match anywhere else in the genome database. And they're called what is called orphan genes. In other words, they're genes that seem to be specific to that particular animal. And what that suggests is that there was very, very, very strong selection for um, uh, genes to be evolved that specifically regulate the A and G. So unlike the light organ, which seems to be a tinkering with eye-like genes, the accessory nidamental gland has a whole bunch of orphan genes. In other words, it's kind of unique organ. There are other cephalopods that have that um, accessory nidamental gland, but no cephalopod who has that has had their genome sequenced yet. So <laughs> we're waiting on that. I just find that's amazing that they can co-opt another feature, a bacteria, to act as an additional sex organ for them. That's crazy, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, so, so the eye is a really interesting structure. Um, in in um, there has been work on things like insects where there's a cassette of t of genes, uh, the eye what they are called the eye specification genes, and those genes um, when when you when they're um, induced will create what is called an ectopic eye. Like in an insect, if you induce those genes on the leg of an insect, you can cause the formation of an eye. I mean, it's really weird. And it's just because those genes have a routine that they go through and they generate an eye. Well, it turns out that in the light organ, um, I had a great postdoc, uh, Suzanne Pyre, who uh, showed that those are responsive to the presence of light production by the bacteria and get turned on, um, those genes that are associated with um, eye development. So it's, you know, the, the convergence is really deep. Yeah, it's like, uh, I know it's not the same, but it's like me putting my hand on your shoulder and I could see through your eyes, you know, for a little while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, and what's, what's really amazing is, and it's fun, you know, of course, humans are terrestrial organisms. And so we don't often think of, of counter-illumination. And um, counter-illumination, this emission of light and coordination with the eye is extremely common in the marine environment. Um, and so that down in the mesopelagic zone, which is that region of the ocean that's 100 meters to a, 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 on average, 100 meters to 1,000 meters um, in the open ocean, that area, something like 99% um, of the animals by biomass and something like 70% 70, 70 by species, those animals counter-illuminate. Now, most of them um, counter-illuminate by autogenic, what, they, what is called autogenic luminescence. In other words, they make their own chemicals to make that light. Um, the ones that have symbiotic systems, there are about 30 families of fishes that have luminous bacterial um, uh, organs. And, and then there are um, a bunch of the squid species that have luminous bacterial organs. Most of the animals that have bacterial organs are, are either shallow water nocturnal animals or they're uh, associated with the substrate, you know, in other words, the benthic animals on the continental shelf or slope. It makes me wonder if um, in, in people, you know, all the bacteria we have, I mean, we don't consciously think that we're sensing in a new way because of them, but we probably are. 
you know, like our gut bacteria, oh. we're probably, I don't know, we can probably, maybe that's what, I'm, I'm stretching this here, but maybe that's where gut feeling comes from. Maybe we're sensing <laughs> in some additional way because of our gut bacteria. Oh, that's a, that's a really good point. You know, it's, it's been, I mean, the data are, are now almost airtight that um, that the bacteria, you know, the gut brain axis is huge and that um, uh, mood and all kinds of everything from autism to, um, to depression to, um, you know, all kinds of anxiety and so on and so forth, then it seems to be under the control of the balance of your microbiota in your gut is very, very important. And so it's not too much of a stretch at all. And in fact, uh, one of the things that we do with the squid vibrio system is because it's just one host and one microbe, we're able to study the conversation between the host and microbe with very high resolution. And uh, what we, one of the, the reasons why the National Institutes of Health has funded us our whole career is that, um, is that the bacteria, Vibrio fissurized, colonizes persistently the apical surfaces of epithelia. In other words, they're ex extracellular along the apical surfaces of epithelia in very much the same way that our microbes along our guts and along our respiratory passages and so on and so forth, very much the same way. They, those, vac those bacterial consortia colonize the apical surfaces of epithelia. Now, trying to figure out, and there are hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of species that associate with humans, and trying to figure out what any given one of them is doing um, is going to be really, really difficult. And, you know, so with them, we're left with studying the consortium and how the consortium behaves. So with the resolution that we have, we've been able to tell the, the people who work on mammals and humans a few things. Um, one was that it was always known that gram-negative bacteria drive development of portions of our gut. Well, studying the squid, we were able to show that the molecules that drive development of the squid light organ that I talked about, you know, the resorption of those tissues on the surface that, um, that mediate uh, colonization, <clears throat> the induction of development of those is under the control of surface molecules of the bacteria. And those surface molecules affect the host and, and the, the host recognizes those and says, oh, I've got bacteria here. The gut development of, of mammals and humans are under the control of the exact molecule as the squid uses. And so we were able to tell the mammalian community, you should look there. Those are likely the molecules at work because we know that animal evolution occurred always in the background of a large bacterial environment, you know, a very uh, rich bacterial environment. And so there are going to be, because it's happened the whole, all the way through animal evolution, there are going to be highly conserved and highly shared features across the animals, and there are. And the other one we were able to show, we were the first to show that bacteria can drive animal circadian rhythm. And so um, the, the, I <laughs> Uh, the the uh, mammalian biologists have now found, and human biologists have found, that the bacteria are essential for normal um, daily rhythms uh, in the animal. So, have you um, do, do the squid have a uh, a microbiome above and beyond just the Vibrio fissurae, you know, for digestion for other processes like we do? So, we have never found, other than the females, that accessory nitimental gland. The light organ um, seems to be the major microbiome of the animal in the males and in the juveniles. Um, not all animals have persistent gut bacteria. Um, you know, guts, certainly bacteria that are transiently going through with the food, help the animal digest the food that it takes in. But not, you know, it seems like a shared derived character and that of, of all of the jawed vertebrates, uh, and that is fishes on up, um, are, is the carriage of a very complex consortium persistently. So that if you starve, you retain your microbes in reservoirs along the, the gut epithelium. And then when you eat again, they do them again. In lots of invertebrates, if 
you starve them, they lose all their bacteria. And so in, in Euprimna, this little squid, um, we have found no evidence of bacteria in the gut persistently. And so if persistent symbiont seems to be the real fissure. Um, the, the students in the lab uh, can take a squid and put it in a mortar and pestle and homogenize it and place the place a whole baby animal. And the only thing that comes up on the plate is the real fissure. Now that's not to say, you know, there aren't there might not be things that are unculturable or, you know, um, uh, we just don't pick up. But if you look at the, the animal under either FEM or with a live dead stain in the living animal by confocal microscopy, you never see any bacteria, living bacteria, associating with the surfaces on the animal. Unlike our, you know, we have lots of bacteria, but beneficial bacteria on our skin. It doesn't seem that they do that. And so one of the things is being in the ocean with all those bacteria around, why would you cover yourself with bacteria? You would want to at least control it. Um, now, one of the interesting things that's happened recently is a group um, did the microbiome of a cuttlefish. You know, there's big CCO fish in so those things are adult, as adults can be, you know, nearly a foot long. I mean, they're really big things, right? And they found, looking all over the tissues of this animal, that it had two symbionts. One associated with the esophagus of the animal and one associated with the gill, one type of bacterium. And the rest of the body was clean. So whereas vertebrates seem to have complex consortia and certain invertebrates like termites so that they can eat wood um, and cockroaches, their relatives of termites, they have complex consortia uh, that help them digest all kinds of weird stuff. But it's not that common. Um, for them, for there to be highly, um, highly complex uh, consortia associated with the yeah. Is there any difference in um, the performance of the Vibrio fisheri in different, uh, you know, adults of squid? You know, are some better at making light patterns or some not as good or some can use additional color variations? Yeah. So, so. Um, I'll tell you why I'm asking, because if that was the case, have you tried transplanting the Vibrio fisheri, you know, from one squid to another, and did that do anything? That's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so one of the one of the things that we have fairly recently discovered is that there is very tremendous strain variation um, in the bacteria uh, that, and it changes the way the animal responds to them, and it changes the way that they respond to the animal. And so this is kind of a frontier area that we're just getting into. And it's mainly done by Ned Ruby's lab. And he has a great postdoc in his lab, Cotille Bongrand. And she's been doing this. And she shows that all of those things, so I should say that for 30 years, we've been studying one strain that we've been able to genetically manipulate. Um, all the genetics were developed in a strain called ES114. And so um, recently we've been <clears throat> branching out from that and looking at these other strains. And um, it's a fascinating frontier. At this point, um, we know a lot about their behavior and how they do this and a little bit about their genetics. And a lot of full genome sequences have been done with them. But it's a new, it's a new area. Okay. Well, what, uh, what future experimentation do you want to conduct? And what, what do you want to elucidate from here? What are your goals? Yeah, so, so one of the things that, that we're really excited about is, you know, I told you about those, those uh, regions that are the migration pathway of the bacteria. So the bacteria aggregate on the surface, they go through a pore, they go up a long duct, which is about, you know, um, something like, you know, 20 body lengths of the bacteria. And then they go into an antechamber, which is also about 20 body lengths of the bacteria. Then they squeeze through this tiny bottleneck uh, that, that, uh, that selects one or two, and then they go out and, and in the crypts. So one of the things we're really excited about is defining the biomechanics and biochemistry of that migration pathway. Nobody can do that with the kind of resolution that we can do that. 
And so I had a really great uh, postdoc in the lab, Tara Ethic Burns, who's working on defining the, the biomechanical and biochemical uh, characteristics of the migration pathway of the bacteria. And why, you know, what is each area accomplishing for determining specificity of the symbiont? And so that's a really exciting area. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're, we're asking the question of how circadian rhythms are controlled. Um, and we, we know that there's, that the animal um, uh, has a day-night cycle on, on what it feeds the bacteria. So in the morning, it feeds the bacteria a certain set of things, and then in the evening, it feeds them another set of things. And this is accompanied by changes in the cells that are associated with the light organ. And how is that controlled? And so, and, and that will tell us how, you know, circadian rhythms of, <clears throat> of provision of nutrients is controlled to this particular organ. And it's exciting because one of the cells that's associated with this um, day-night cycle are the blood cells. So the blood cells migrate to the, the light organ at night, and they stay away from the light organ during the day. And so Eric Cope, the, the guy who raised the squid through the life cycle, he's the one working on that. And it's really interesting because it turns out that he found um, a molecule that goes up in gene expression uh, during the day, and it's something that prevents those, those blood cells from migrating to the light organ. And so it's very low. In the, the cells are very low in number in the light organ during the day. And then this, this, this molecule, is, uh, its production is suppressed at night so that those blood cells flood in. So there's this really great day-night cycle. And what's cool about that is that in humans, the, the blood cell supply um, to the gut is on a circadian rhythm. And so there are, there are all these very cool analogies between the, the, the different, these different things. We're also um, beginning to look at, you know, I talk about the eyes and the gills and that the, the, the light organ changes their gene expression. How right, in the yep. world is that, how is that done? Is that a chemical thing? Is it a neural thing? In other words, how does the eye get the message? How does the gill get the message? And so what we're doing is we're trying to figure out how that works. I don't know how co-evolution happens at all. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. Why would oh, the squid, yeah. you know, how, how does the squid know or care about or, I don't know, how does it adapt itself so that it helps another another creature that is not it? It's just very strange, you know? Well, so, so the, the way that we thought as, you know, in, in biology all these years has been, and we, we model things as individuals and so on and so forth. What we have to do is we have to get away from that. All animals are affected by living in a microbial world. Many of them are nested ecosystems themselves, like humans and other vertebrates, and, and the squid vibrio system, that's a nested ecosystem. And so there, there is, the, the, the issue is that um, it's actually quite controversial whether or not there's selection pressure on what is called the holobiont. In other words, both things together. But certainly they co-evolve. And so, so it's not, one should, we should start thinking more holistically about, about this. It's not that, um, that, uh, that this isn't the way animal evolution happens. Animal evolution happens in the background of bacteria and other microbes. Quick, quick question. Do the uh, Vibrio fisheri leave the squid during the daytime to go feed? I mean, what would be the point Actually, of the uh, squid expelling them all? So it doesn't expel them all. It expels not, about 90% of them. And the remaining 10% grow up at night, or excuse me, grow up during the day when the animal's in the sand, so that when it comes out at night, it's ready to counter-illuminate. So it only gets the bacteria one time. Uh, in early in you know early in life in the first few hours of life it recruits the bacteria and then that bac those bacteria grow in the light organ and then are most of them are flushed out and then they grow back and flushed out and grow back um, but the bacteria go out into the surrounding seawater and the you know the especially where vibrio fisheri occurs it's mainly oligotrophic in other words low nutrient the seawater is low nutrient environment 
So the bacteria really don't get, don't grow like they do in the squid. So it's thought that the squid is the principal, um, the principal uh, environment of the bacteria, and that, and that this, um, this, this, you know, they go out in the environment and are recaptured. Um, they are members of the bacteria plankton, but I think that they're fairly inactive out there. Right. So this is really interesting stuff. We're um, we're close to the top of the hour, so we have to end. But uh, what what's the best way for people to learn more about your lab and you and read papers and interact? I think just go to our website. Um, I think it's glowingsquid.org. I think it is. <laughs> no problem. Okay. Well, Margaret, thank you for being here. It's been uh, really super interesting. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.